Hey everyone, this episode was recorded way back on the 11th of August 2020. We initially intended to tie it into the release of The Kingsman back when that film was set to come out in September. Of course, as was the case with pretty much every film release from 2020, The Kingsman was delayed. Until... now? At the time of recording this intro, it's set for a February release, and hopefully it won't be delayed again because I can't be bothered recording another one of these. Anyway, that's just a bit of context to explain things such as why we are talking about how hot the weather is. Not to mention allusions to things like a Donald Trump White House. Enjoy! Hello, welcome to Diminishing Returns. Uh, If that introductory greeting sounded a bit forced, it's because we are recording basically inside the fart of the sun. It's not (laughs) like the hottest day I can recall in a while. It's unbearable and uh, we've all had to close our windows and turn any fans off so that you don't get any annoying noise in the background of this recording. I was going to say, Sol, you're not even in London. You should be feeling bad for me and Alan. Yeah. Why, is it hotter in London? Yeah. Of course it's hotter in London. Because of the pollution. Yeah. And it's closer to the equator. <laughs> is it? Well, technically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's a little disclaimer up front, because I have a feeling it's going to impact this record. I feel like our... I feel like my head's not where it needs to be to record. <laughs> I feel like Anna, Alan's coming in very low energy. Yeah. Calvin's really cranky. He's like really irritable. Uh, <laughs> they are, of course, the 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 three of us. Oh God, see what I mean? They are the two people I am recording with today. I'm Sol, and I just told you, Alan. <laughs> Hello, and Calvin. That'll edit into something workable. Say hi, guys. <laughs> Hello, I'm Calvin. <laughs> And the reason we're all getting together on this this ridiculous day <laughs> is to discuss the sequel to 2014's Kingsman, <laughs> The Secret Service. Why? Uh, which which was, uh, what was that film called? It was called uh, Kingsman, The Golden Circle? The Gold Circle? The Golden, Golden Circle. Circle. Yeah. So we're, we're, God, I'm really struggling with this. Can you tell? We're discussing 2017's sequel to 2014's Kingsman film. So we are discussing Kingsman the Gold Circle. Golden, Golden Circle. Circle. The Golden Circle. Yeah, and we we covered the original Kingsman film at some point. Um, we did, I think, back when, uh, back when this film was coming out. We covered the original film leading up to that. We, did, we have covered this sequel... In one of our review uh, of the year episodes, but I recall at the time Sol had not seen it. Yes. Um, so we've got that to look forward to. But yeah, so we revisited it. I had to rewatch it. I resent that greatly, Oof. and I'm going to take it out on all of you tonight. Oh goodness! <laughs> oh, so I was wrong when I said Calvin was irritable. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, you can uh, listen to our uh, other episode on Kingsman on the original film. Yes, uh, number 68, Kingsman the Secret Service from uh, September 2017. If I could just harken back to that, because uh, my opinion of that film has changed quite significantly, actually, since we last recorded. Basically, how our last record went was I was sort of saying, oh, it's fun and nonsense and fun and stuff and alan was like no it's for these social and economic reasons it is not good uh it's <laughs> pushing on, these we, agendas are we talking about kingsman one or kingsman two here kingsman one sorry okay yeah yeah no i i remember taking issue with the the fact that matthew vaughan has got such clearly underlying right wing tendencies mm. that are just like just bubbling under the surface of his films and mm. And it just slightly rubs me the wrong way when I'm watching his films. Hmm. Although I do superficially quite enjoy them. 
Mm. I have. Well, yes, no, I, I, I used to be like that with Kingsman, but ever since, because I, I rewatched it for a video review that I did for my YouTube channel, because obviously the Bond connections and whatnot, and I went back and listened to. What's that, that YouTube pre- channel called, Calvin? It's, it's the Calvin Dyson YouTube channel. Just Well, it's just Calvin Dyson. <laughs> so if I search for Calvin D Y S O N, I'll find it. I thought it was Calvin Dyson 007 reviewer or something like that. Have you changed it again? Yes, it's just Calvin Dyson now. Are you planning to branch out from Bond? Is that what this is? No, 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 no. It was uh, just everything else was clunky. <laughs> just thought, have you tr- are you <laughs> anyway. What about Calvin Investigates? That's quite snappy. <laughs> It's like Hetty Wainthrop. What about what about <laughs> Calvin Vestigates? <laughs> oh, that's quite good actually. <laughs> no, it's not because that's not what you do <laughs> on the channel. <laughs> Maybe I should. What about Start anyway? Investigating things. What about what about Calvin the Middle? <laughs> <laughs> Calvin the thick of it. <laughs> Um, I, I have pulled up the um, uh, Kingsman episode uh, we have here just to look at what ratings we gave that film back when we covered it. So Kingsman 1, Kingsman the Secret Service, uh, Alan and myself uh, both gave a 7 out of 10 score. Calvin, mm-hmm. you gave it an 8 out of 10 back in Shit, really? You gave it 7? I, yeah. The first one I was okay with, the second one I hated. We'll get on to that. Oh, later. right. Oh. But no, the first one I was okay with. It was fine, bit of entertainment. But yeah, I, I, but I think Alan and I were both roughly aligned with that in that we thought it was solid, good fun, in a kind of superficial nonsense way. Plenty of flaws, and a lot of the um, like, like you hinted at just now, a lot of the kind of underlying, you know, subtexts perhaps didn't mm. quite sit well with us. I think that was more of an issue for me, to be honest. Yeah, it probably was, but Alan was a bit more uh, vocal about it on the podcast. So when I was listening <laughs> back to it, I was sort of like, "Oh, actually, yeah, these are all really uh, prudent points." I can't remember. I think what Alan I said, took I... more issue with logical problems, actually, from what I remember. Things like um, what was it? It was something to do with that woman uh, putting her baby in the other room, and then oh what was yeah. It? Because I remember Alan and I both attempted an improv sequence <laughs> in it, when it, it didn't go. It didn't go well enough to get left in the edit. <laughs> what were we talking about? The what? What would that phone call be like? Where she's <laughs> yeah, she's locked the baby yeah. in the bathroom. Hello, emergency services. I I hear that some villain is. Uh, putting out some mind control that's making everyone evil and, like, violent. Right, well, what you need to do is lock your baby in the bathroom. <laughs> it was something like that. I don't quite remember. It was a logical problem we had with the first film, but I'm afraid I didn't re-watch the first film for this no, episode. I, I only watched the second one. The one so, no, Calvin, you have recently re- re-reviewed your review? Yes. Uh, well, I would have gone down to either a five or six out of ten, actually. Um, wow. The, the, the so kind of more insidious... It, it was the first time, I should point out, watching it sort of by myself and sober. And that <laughs> makes a big difference. And especially after hear, listening back to our podcast and hearing your guys' um, take on it, it, a lot of the stuff did become very apparent. And I also had recently... Uh, well, after The Kingsman, but I've also recently seen another of Matthew Vaughan's films, Layer Cake, which I also... Oh, yeah. Yes. thought had underlying issues Proto-bond. with it um <laughs> yeah. uh but yeah and, and i think it is just the whole kind of you've got mark miller who's your scottish socialist anarchist and matthew vaughan who seems to be this is very uh, uh, mark miller i i thought mark miller was bordering on fascist tendencies am i confusing him with someone else well you know batman writing was quite fascistic. you're thinking of benito mussolini that's, that's <laughs> confusing. Very similar people. Views that kind of, Matthew Vaughan has this very sort of pro establishment, uh, anti working class kind of vibe to his stuff. Um, and I, I kind of find that quite unpalatable in this uh, current climate. And you hate the working class, so that's really saying something. <laughs> <laughs> but, is, but isn't that, I mean, doesn't that gel very well with James Bond and, and the well, whole Bond thing? I don't know if it really... I think Bond tends to stay away from those sorts of... Um, it, it doesn't address them, I would say. Um, You're right. Where Kingsman really does throw it in your face. It makes a huge thing about 
the importance of being a gentleman, whatever that means. I think that really rubbed Alan and myself the wrong way. We didn't like any of that, the idea of what being a gentleman is and and that being defined as something to aspire towards above other things when it basically means that you drink the correct whiskey and you beat people up in the correct fashion. (laughs) It it was all just very... um, I, I remember there being something that I didn't like at all, which was the the uh the final moments where he's going to rescue the princess as well and and she's like <laughs> scared and then he's sort of like oh, i'll let you out uh, for a kiss and she's like mm. and i remember you saying oh it's just a bit of fun and me being mm. a bit like well it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't quite sit well with me that whole i, I you know i i get I get what it's going for, but that followed by uh, the anal sex reward <laughs> at the end just felt a bit kind of... Um, and, you know, and I bring that up not just to refresh people's memory, but also because she is a central character in the sequel. Mm. Um, yeah, so have you have you rewatched the second film since rewatching the first one? Uh, I only watched it for the second time in preparation for this podcast a couple of nights ago. Yeah. And just out of interest, because you you said there that basically it's the first time you've watched the film sober, (laughs) and that made a big difference. How are those AA meetings going? (laughs) Are you you able to do it with the social distancing and everything? Well, I think we've just solved it, Alan, because we often ask what it is you get out of James Bond, and I was just wondering if you've ever watched any of those sober as well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I have. It's not well. I mean, I should point out I watched the second one with my partner, uh, and I had some whiskeys because I obviously there's a lot of whiskey talk in this. Hearing the word whiskey, you knew you wouldn't be able to yeah <laughs> get through a film myself. where they talk about whiskey without drinking Just... one. Of course, you shouldn't watch whiskey galore, Calvin. You'd probably die. <laughs> oh, I love that film. <laughs> uh... I, j- just quickly, just before we get into the film, I just had to look up Mark Miller's political views, and yes, indeed, he describes himself as uh, being to the left of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> uh, oh, really? Oh, well, I, 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 I must be confusing him. I, I know that um, there is a Batman writer held in very high regard who is known for like creating really questionably like r- racist <laughs> and quite uh, fascistic content and i i'm gonna have to look up who that is he- well it might be him because it in in that same tweet he says uh but as a writer i'm interested in people who have a different worldview to my own so mm. maybe he is deliberately mm. provocative in that way but it, I, I, either way i don't like him and uh matthew vaughn they seem like pretty pretty horrible people actually yeah matthew vaughn and i i say this I'm I'm taking a huge swing here into the you know stab in the dark. I don't know the man, obviously. He's definitely. I've never children. even so much a <laughs> <laughs> steps on mice for fun. <laughs> um, I've never so much as you know watched him do an interview or anything like that. But just going off of his films, and I think I've seen I think I've seen all but one of his films at this point. I know I've seen Stardust, Kick Ass. X Men First Class, Kingsman One and Two, Layer Cake. Are there any others? No, that's it. Mm. You've seen every film. Okay, okay. So I've seen all of his films. Looking at this, um, you just get the sense that he is the classic, your, your classic thing where someone feels like they're a self-made man and they've pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, and therefore everyone else should be able to do what they do through a bit of hard work, but. Oh, oh, yeah, completely. No, that, totally. That's the impression I get of him and his politics based on his films. That he he doesn't he doesn't check his privilege. I suppose is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Can I just read you from the Wikipedia page of Matthew Vaughan? Go on. <laughs> it says, uh, okay, until 2002, he thought he was the child of a relationship between his mother and American actor Robert Vaughan. Mm, Fair enough. Yes. But a paternity investigation revealed that Robert Vaughan was not his father. His actual biological father is George Albert Harley de Vere Drummond, an English aristocrat <laughs> who was a godson of King George VI. So I don't know where you're getting this privileged background idea from. 
He is also, like, I listened to his audio commentary for Layer Cake, and he just comes across as very smoke. At one point, he uh, starts bitching about uh, people not understanding the, f- the narrative or whatever, and he's sort of like, oh, if people don't understand this, they should be watching Snow White and Seven Dwarves, because this is all perfectly clear. We've crossed every T, we've dotted every I, and uh, it's just perfect, and that's, it, that's his attitude to it. He made this fantastic thing, and if you don't like it, that's because you're an idiot, and <laughs> and, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I I don't like him. <laughs> Do you know he's married to Claudia Schiff? Yeah. Is he really? Wow. Yeah. Do you want to uh, read us the names of his children? <laughs> 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 I've just looked at I've just looked at the names of his children. Let's not pick on the children. It's not their fault, but you know. <laughs> I, I would like to recant what I was saying, slagging off Mark Miller. I, I've done enough Googling to realise what my mistake is. I'm sure plenty of listeners have been pulling their hair out and screaming as they <laughs> listen to this. There's a, there's a very well-known comic book artist who, who's done a lot of Batman stuff called Frank Miller. And I oh, think yeah, I conflated yeah. him with Mark Miller uh, due to the similar surname. So, sorry, Mark. Hmm. I, uh, I I take it back. You You probably... You socialist scum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just before we move on, I'm just gonna drop. I-, I keep dropping out of the conversation, uh, so I'm just gonna come out and then come back in again. All right. All right. Right now we've uh, we've got let's the room just to talk ourselves without Calvin. Calvin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Four. Time. What a fucking dickhead. <laughs> Bet he's putting a load of weight stupid. in the lockdown. <laughs> Stupid fucking shirts. <laughs> the collar, collars up round his neck. Like he's, a stupid he's got his, fucking... He's got his uni hair on now. It's a lockdown. He's grown it out. <laughs> he's got his Bieber fringe yeah, back. Yeah. Uh, and, and the... Uh, no class as well. No class. <laughs> oh, God. This is hard to sustain. I was hoping he'd come back in in the middle of it. And... <laughs> he's probably here already. He's just letting us burn ourselves out. <laughs> he probably came in, heard what we were saying, and got so offended that he just left. <laughs> Jimmy Carr looking motherfucker. Ah, hello. Oh, hello. Sorry <laughs> oh, about that. Sorry. Uh, we, were, we were just talking about Matthew Vaughn. We, uh, okay. <laughs> we were just we were just uh we were just complimenting your appearance. <laughs> My appearance. <laughs> what I uh, yeah no I think I think my phone is actually overheating. I've taken it off its charger because I think it was actually like the apps would general would genuinely I couldn't get back into Skype. I I've had that actually happen. I I remember driving one day in in very hot weather and the phone was obviously right in the windscreen of the car. I was using it for the map, so it was heating up in the glass of the car and it. A little message actually popped up saying, like... I'm too hot. Fo- fo- yeah, I've never seen it any other time, but a little message popped up saying, like, phone entering emergency shutdown, like, cooling protocol. Oh <laughs> <laughs> like a I was like, what the fuck? Fu- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we don't like Matthew Vaughan. Mark Millar, we're, we're, we're less sure of but you might you might be you might be a bell end we don't know you might be lovely but i i just just to get back uh onto the slagging off matthew vaughn thing um <laughs> i think that kingsman 2 is pure matthew vaughn i think this is the most freedom he's had as a filmmaker and that's mm. why it's so terrible i i think matthew really? vaughn is a bad filmmaker and the more freedom he gets the 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 worse it is Mm. I think that Kingsman 2 was very interesting um, because we, we've just complained about his uh, personality. And <laughs> I, I have to say, I, I feel like a lot of Kingsman 2, which I only watched for the first time yesterday in preparation for this podcast, um, a lot of the film felt almost like an apology from him, almost like he'd kind of... I don't know, like, taken on board certain criticisms about the first film and his stuff in general, or... Like what? Well, for example, I, I feel like the Matthew Vaughan of the first film would never have made... They, he would have made a film where, like, drug users are evil and bad and all that, but, like, this film's clearly quite against 
anti-drug people. You know, it's it's against the war on drugs. And maybe that's just because Matthew Vaughan's a cokehead and he's not. Oh, he definitely all the time. is. <laughs> well, maybe not. Maybe Allegedly. not. I'm saying this as a parody satire. <laughs> that's thing. Calvin's yeah. opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's just my opinion. It felt to me like more of a traditionally Hollywood lefty, bleeding heart liberal approach to something like drugs, where oh, now the president who's trying to ban drugs is this evil, maniacal, cackling villain. Whereas the first film, it felt like the guy who made that film would have been on the, on the same side as the president, and you would have been asked to think, yeah, good on you, president. Good on you, Kingsman society, for killing everyone who takes drugs. I don't know, I think this is where Matthew Vaughan's sort of personal politics kind of uh, get confusing, and that's why I, I don't mm. think that people on first watching, like, for example, the first Kingsman, like, I didn't really see all this stuff, and it is there if you look for it. And I think a part of him is kind of uh, libertarian quite... I think he is a a, a true libertarian, actually. I think that's probably a better way to describe him. Um, And I think he probably does advocate sort of legalization of, you know, and uh, Emily uh, Watson's character does have that little speech about, like, oh, well, what about the, you know, functioning professionals and recreational, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. They're certainly yeah. making the Filmmakers. case for it. Yes. <laughs> Although I must say, you know, we, we, we sound like that was all we spoke about with the first Kingsman film, and it wasn't, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, a filmmaker's political views aren't the be-all and end-all. It's, you know, it, it, you can have completely opposing views to me and and make a film really well <laughs> and I'll, I'll oh yeah yeah respect it if not enjoy it mm. Mm. and you know and I think to an extent that's what I got from Kingsman and I and I want to pick up what Alan was saying there that he thinks that Matthew Vaughan is a bad filmmaker because I I don't think that at all but I do think he has very self-indulgent and lazy tendencies and mm. they are on full force in, in Kingsman 2, mm. uh, because presumably he's had more people reining them in. Yeah. Um, you know, th- th- there's one scene in particular in Kingsman 2, um, which I suppose I'm going to dive straight into now, um, that really hammered that home for me. You know, Matthew Vaughan, he's known for these hugely elaborate, dynamic action sequences, often set to a, an upbeat soundtrack. There's one scene in particular in Kingsman 2 where they're fighting the bad guy in that sort of 1950s diner. It's practically like watching someone play a video game because the, yeah. the, mm. the amount of CGI stitching between... The whole thing is put together as if it's one seamless take. But mm. it's so blatantly Frankenstein together from about 500 different shots with CGI filling in the gaps that it just looks so fake. And he does that, this a lot. And, and, and that... And that isn't necessarily... Yeah, and and that's not necessarily a problem. You know, I think there's a place for that kind of cool for the sake of cool stuff. But the problem when I was watching that shot and I really sat back and started analysing it, because it took me out of the film as it was happening, which isn't a good sign. The problem was, you know, if you're doing one shot for the whole thing, it should feel organic. The camera movement should feel natural. Whereas with this, it was like... Right, now I want to go to a long shot of this guy with his fist raised up, about to hit the other guy, so the camera's going to swing back over here to get back into place. And it was like, right, so you could have just cut to that shot, but you arbitrarily felt the need to move the camera. You, you've struck on something I particularly hate uh, about this film, so mm. Because he does this all the time, it's the same with the opening scene in the taxi, uh, where they have a fight and it's just totally unnatural camera movements. And, Mm. you know, this arbitrary, oh, let's put an upbeat song on the top of it, because I've Mm. seen Guardians of the Galaxy, it worked. And it it just really annoys me. And it's obviously, it's come from, they did it in the first film with the scene where Colin Firth goes into the church thing and has a massive fight. Yeah, free bird. And it kind of works there because you're focusing on this one person in the middle of a melee. And so to have this kind of style... Yeah, and it's it's a big show-stopping sequence in the film. I think you're allowed one of those in your mm. film. But this film has about four or five distinct moments where they are trying to recreate that magic and it just doesn't it doesn't quite work. And it, and the problem is, you know, I I I think some of those scenes are good fun, very dynamic and put together in an entertaining way, but 
it's it's this one in particular that struck me because it it went on far too long so it, to the point that it did just become completely self-indulgent and like i say the camera movements weren't justified in that opening taxi sequence yeah it's a bit over the top it's a bit over shot and over edited but it's ultimately serving the story for the most part you know that scene is there for a reason it's not too long and and it's right at the beginning it It sets you up with a bit of action but i just didn't like the way it's shot yeah most of the shots are essentially and movements are essentially justified by Mm. what's happening you know i i don't mind it if in this scene i'm complaining about there's several times where for example Channing Tatum will like, or whoever it is, will I can't remember who's in that scene at that point. <laughs> Someone has a whip. I'm guessing it's Channing Tatum, but it might no, be the other bad guy. It's the other guy. It's a uh, Pedro Pascal. All right, so Pedro Pascal, he'll grab his whip, and the camera will follow the tip of the whip as it throws out. And I'm okay with that because you're following something naturally within the within the film. You know, it's like it makes sense that you want to see where that's going. It's an organic movement. But then there's other bits where the camera will just swing around to a different shot to set up a frame so that someone can run into it. And that mm. is what I don't like because it feels completely artificial and like like someone's running around with a camera and they've choreographed this scene and they know what's about to happen. And it, it just, that's what I didn't like. And I, I know it's a very fine line that I'm kind of trying yeah. to make a distinction between this is a part of what i really don't like about what i would say probably matthew vaughan's style in general is the artifice everything is so fake everything is fake and like even in this there's a in the taxi fight scene you know puts his elbow through a window and the window smash is fake they mean like they can't (laughs) even bother to do a fake glass window and i just don't uh, and then you know the scene in a car chase drifting it's like well that looks fake you've got julianne mm. moore on a set that looks like it's probably about 30 percent uh real physical set and i, I just it, it's it's not just that it's all fake it's that it's so obvious like if you're gonna do it do it well I always think that this is a way of them working around some kind of limited budget. For some reason, I always think of these as being kind of like, oh, they're in like sort of like the 50 million bracket. But these are sort of around the hundred million dollar budget marks. And I'm surprised at how much the... Because fair enough, like if if they had a significantly lower budget, I would be more forgiving of these things because Mm. they do look... It looks like a video game cutscene in so many things. And the lack of doing anything for real, it does just take you out of it. And particularly in the taxi sequence, because that's opening the film it just uh, yeah and the camera's doing things that the camera could never do as soul uh quite uh well articulated i think it's um yeah i, just, I never believe any of the action sequences mm. and it's a shame because it makes me hark for a scene where they put something together like that for real mm. and like i i know it wouldn't be that elaborate but like how about you go away and you spend that money on you know, making the most insanely elaborate action sequence that's shot for real that you can do. Mm. Because it's so much more impressive. It it actually reminded me of, there's a scene in Zombieland 2, of all films, that's a very similar, we're just going to stop the film for five minutes and do a huge one-take action sequence. But they did film it all for real and then Mm. stitch the, the camera shots together digitally. But, you know, it's it's... And and the end result is something. Basically, I'm I'm talking about it because it, it just reminded me of it watching this film. Um, you know, a sequel with a weird action one take scene in the middle that's stitched together. But it, it was just so much more impressive in this pretty modest uh film, Zombieland mm. Two, in terms of action. Um, purely because you could tell it was just someone running around with a camera and like you know a well choreographed thing where the actors all had to run around and hit their mark at the right time mm. I, I don't know it just they they're going for something so much more extreme and that's admirable except they can't do it for real and therefore it just becomes pointless you know tom cruise is going into space for real for a new movie he's making and that that's what we should all strive (laughs) strive for we should all strive to be tom cruise hanging off the side of of skyscrapers for real (laughs) we should not be just thinking like matthew vaughan oh we can just fucking do a cgi map of (laughs) of 
Colin Firth because I saw they did it for the Matrix Reloaded and that worked fine. It, mm. It's it's just upsetting. But on on the other side of that, you know, it feels like a wasted opportunity because these are at the heart of them such fun, engaging action sequences. I think for the most part that you know were they just put together a bit more practically with a bit more thought put into them mm. i'd be all over them i'd think wow this is amazing hmm. shall we crack the plot a little bit should we should we quickly recap the first film even because that kind of leads directly into it yeah cuz even this film doesn't really do much effort to uh sort of recap i mean in the in the first scene <laughs> they do start with a little terminatoresque scan of a character saying like oh it's this guy from the previous film who was this character and i was i remember watching it going oh thank god they did that because i would never in a million years have remembered this this actor from the first film (laughs) i was gonna ask if you did because like this is not like a star returning like this is a a working actor i guess um i don't even know who it what what his name is holcroft Edward, Edward Holcroft. Yeah. Okay. Let Playing me say, Charlie. though, I think he comes out of this film better than anyone else because his character mm, is mm. so different to the one he plays in the first film, even though it's the same character. Looks completely different. And, you know, in behaviour is a bit hard and more rough and tumble. So I think in terms of him as an actor, like character mm, diversity, mm. I think it's oh, brilliant yeah. for him. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll echo that, yeah. I, I kind of wish there'd been a bit more, a bit more of seeing him going from his place in the first film to this cuz i don't know it it just it didn't feel like the natural next step i can totally buy that that guy would go and become a baddie but i just felt like seeing a bit of that evolution might have been nice although we it, it is implied that he dies in the first film so they have to kind of fumble their way mm. out of that well it's not even the most egregious example of a deceased character uh, coming back. <laughs> so, yeah. The I, initially, I assumed he was dead in the first film, and I had remembered that correctly because I remembered him dying pretty much. So, yeah, I, I initially assumed, oh, he died in the first film, and they've brought him back with robot stuff. But then it turns out it's just his arm is now a robot arm. Yeah, was because right? the chip that was in his neck that would have blown up his head was dislodged by Eggsy's electric ring thing, and apparently it went mm. moved down, and then it blew off his arm and his vocal cords. But what? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like if you, <laughs> yeah, if you short circuit the thing and it's damaged it, so it doesn't work. I can go with that. But it yeah. moved down to his shoulder. What? <laughs> <laughs> but but not only that, but. Why wouldn't you just write it that he got killed and then a villain swept in and like six million dollar manned him and turned him into a robot <laughs> that she could use as a bad guy? Okay, we're kind of circling around one of the major points that I want to bring up and I guess we might as well talk about it now. It's the fact that this film is so intent on bringing back characters from the first one, calling back to the first one. It's a real continuation of what was in that first film and I'm kind of baffled as to why especially because the model seems to be like oh we're gonna do you know james bond sort of stuff where obviously i they're, completely agree yeah yeah, they're largely self-contained adventures and here it's they they may they really go to shoehorning in like to the fact that eggsy is now dating a princess which yeah from, is who was bizarre. a throwaway gag at the yeah. end of the last film was he saved the princess and Suddenly, this film is doing this very weird meta deconstruction of James Bond by looking at James Bond if he were in a committed relationship. And I don't dislike that, but I will say that's something surely that you say for Kingsman 5. You know, that's (laughs) not... That's not what you do on your second outing. It's, It's very weird. To say that these films are pitched as a kind of James Bond pastiche... But then when I was watching this, I thought, well, maybe maybe that's not what it's meant to be. Maybe Matthew Vaughn's just trying to make his own spy movies. Mm. But then it absolutely is what it's supposed to be. They have a conversation about their favourite James Bond tropes in the first film over dinner. <laughs> so uh. it, it just, I don't know, it's really weird. But I mean, I, I have to say, and I suppose this is a point in favour of what Alan was saying, that Matthew Vaughn isn't perhaps the best director in the world. I repeatedly found myself questioning whether or not this film and the previous film 
are supposed to be comedies because mm. Mm. they play to me as full on comedy movies like bordering on austin powers level spoof to this, be honest this one feels mm. like a parody of the first film yeah <laughs> but i could also like they play in such a way that i could pretty much believe matthew vaughn just thinks it's all cool <laughs> do you know what i mean like yeah. it's not actually meant to be a joke it's meant to be deadly serious and i'm just sat there laughing at it there's obviously gags written into the script but you know i'm talking about robot dogs and uh, <laughs> uh the fact this guy has a robot arm and and the fact that julianne moore is playing this baffling villain who turns people into mincemeat and like that all plays as comedy to me mm. and i thought well maybe that's meant to be serious i don't really know it, mm. is colin firth getting his head blown off and then coming back from the dead is that supposed to be funny because well... it's only it plays like in south park when yeah. <laughs> um when they kill Bill Gates in an episode by having him get shot in the head, but then they decided five seasons later they wanted to have him come back, so they just have him have a bandage around his head <laughs> with like a a bit of blood on it when he appears. It, it's like it's it that would, level of yeah. It would honestly not surprise me at all if we talked about how Matthew Vaughn obviously this is, he has more creative control over this than probably any other film that he's done. Mm. The first one was a big success, and they probably did just say to him, right, just. Do what you want, and it wouldn't surprise me if Edward Holcroft and him just really got along, and the actress that played the Swedish princess, I think he just kind of wanted to get the band back together to do it again, um, Colin Firth, for example, and uh, there was no one there sort of stopping him. Trying to get Colin Firth back into it, I understand the logic of that, because yeah, he's a big he star, he's a, a big part of the first part film. Of- what made the first film the first it's much like men in black 2 which we've spoken about on this podcast before where men in black lives and dies on arguably men in black lives and dies on the chemistry between will smith and tommy lee jones Mm. and their dynamic Mm. and i would say that kingsman the secret service arguably lives and dies on the chemistry between taron edgerton and colin firth and their dynamic so i completely understand this this approach of we've got to get him back. Do you really want to rely on Taron Edgerton for your film? <laughs> Good lord. Oh, he's alright. What's wrong with him? Yeah. Uh, Can we talk about Taron Edgerton? Because I think he's not that good. <laughs> I'm uh, not saying I... he's totally shit. I just think he's a bit shit. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I kind of get where you're coming from. I, I'm going to agree with you, but I'm going to dial it back to be like, 60% as harsh as you're making it sound. <laughs> it's I think, I completely agree, he got really lucky being cast in the first Kingsman in a role that uh, was perhaps not very difficult, but they obviously thought we need someone who, who can kind of get away with playing a quote-unquote chav, is able to talk properly at the end of the film when we need him to be a bit more suave. So we can't just we can't just get an actual kid off the street and uh, <laughs> expect Turgoose. them to be able to do that. <laughs> uh, Thomas Turgoose, of course, another friend of the show. Now he's he was <laughs> on uh, this is England episode. He's in this film as one of uh, Eggsy's mates who who takes a load of drugs, uh, <laughs> does a bit of dancing. And then he's all right at the end. This is the thing about Taron Egerton, just to get my uh, two cents on on him in my because my opinion of him has changed over time. Because I I think he's quite good in. I saw him in Eddie the Eagle. He was quite funny in that. Mm. Um, I I don't lose him in a role, which is saying something because when I first saw him in the first Kingsman, I came out of that being like, oh wow, I really like that they've just found this like young working class actor. Like they never do this yeah. anymore. They're always rather trained, blah de blah, Cumberbatchy, Hiddlestony. <laughs> whatever and i was like oh i'm so glad that we're going back to this you know getting the michael Caine out of the you know the west end slums and he's gonna be a big star and then obviously look him up and he's like oh no he is just plummy voiced mc uh oxbridgeton i saw him in the in the beginning of this film right and he's he's in the full suit and all that and he's looking like and i think he can't pull that off he doesn't pull off the suave uh well-dressed gentleman he doesn't look the part he doesn't he and then when he plays a chav, I think, well, he doesn't really play that very well either. Like, I was I- going to say, yeah. <laughs> now he's dialing the accent back a bit, and it's not full Devo. It's kind of a bit more just like from the streets. It's a bit more Ali G in this than Devo. It just didn't play. And I guess that's maybe because I know it's not real now. But I... 
but I, I think Taryn Edgerton would be great on the stage. I think that's perhaps what's gone wrong. Because mm. the, he's definitely got a charm. I like him, and I, I enjoy the stuff I've seen him in. And Rocket Man, I think he's great in. But I agree, it's it, it's not... It's, it's great in that he's kind of selling this role as Elton John, despite not looking anything like Elton John. And he's kind of able to slip in and out of the singing and the acting and do all that very well. You know, I, I think if he'd got that Oscar nomination that he was sort of in the zeitgeist for off of Rocket Man, his career might sustain. But um, I think you're right, he might go away a bit now. And I wouldn't be surprised if he finds a comfortable home on the West End, to be honest. I think that, that probably... Yeah, I think he's a capable actor, but I do not think he's a leading man top quality. He reminds me of um, Joel Edgerton, you know, <laughs> who kind of had a couple of things and then just like uh, disappeared. I think he's a director now, isn't he, more than anything. Mm. But that's what he makes me think of. Just a sort of very bland, not nothing special kind of actor. Yeah, and I mean, should we should we talk about the cast in this film beyond those two? Because we've we've covered Taron there, we've covered uh, Edward Holcroft a bit. <laughs> I felt like Mark Strong was a was a welcome, very welcome guy to bring back from the first film, and I I felt mm. like he must have been practicing that accent because it wasn't nearly as dreadful as in the first film when I I seem to remember it being very ropey. Mm. Is that just my memory failing me, or did we? Uh, I don't make fun of his bad. dodgy accent. I don't think he was that bad. Um, I thought they bumped him off a bit too soon. I know we're kind of going all over with the plot here. Um, Maybe this is just going to be one of those shows where we don't really go through the plot in sort of a narrative order. But um, because I do just while we're just talking about him, I really like that character. And um, I really like the moment where he sort of sacrifices himself on the mine and stuff um, after he's got all suited up and everything. So he obviously blows up. Um, yeah. Originally, he was going to come back in the wedding at the end with, like, robot legs, and <laughs> he was going <laughs> to survive until the next film, which I think would have been pretty terrible, because they've already kind of removed any, with this whole, Colin Firth can be shot in the head and revived, and they do another, re- you know, they revive someone else in the film. I-, I have no stakes, no kind of life or death peril. That is exactly what I mean about not knowing to what extent this film is meant to be funny and isn't. Because I, I as I watched that scene, I already thought, well, you've had you've had two characters die and be brought back to life in this film already, so I already do not care about anyone <laughs> dying. And yeah. I don't buy that this is the end of Mark Strong anymore. So I almost wish that they had just brought him back immediately, because I would have been like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Which is a problem when you're using that scene to create the closest we get in the film to emotion that, exactly, that yeah. with him with him making this ultimate sacrifice and they kind of really get um, emotional about it i believe that they filmed it but test audiences didn't like it Pres- presumably because you do come out of it like oh well that death meant nothing and um, and i think alan i think you were about to touch on this earlier on about colin firth's character because yeah. the whole point why he dies in the first film is that the mentor dies so that the you know the trainee the apprentice has to go on and save the day so Yes, exactly. And we completely just undo that by just, oh no, just bring him back. And I understand the temptation because Harry and Eggsy, that relationship is what made the first, is part of what made the first one good. Mm. And, but, but they've just got a complete paralysis of they don't know what to do without that. And, um, yeah. But the first film, you know, had balls to kill Colin Firth off as early into the film as it did and mm. leave him dead until the end of the film. So it's a surprisingly limp <laughs> attempt at a sequel to 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 not try and go it alone without him. And they could just have him in flashbacks like they establish early on. He's he's mm. in a flashback up front. Just, you know, bring him back that way is well, very but the, doable. The thing is they they est- they create very early on in the plot the Kingsmen are wiped out. So all your other supporting characters that you've established are gone, except mm. for Mark Strong. But then you've got the two of them as a double act and they're working fine. What's the problem with that? Mark yeah. Strong becomes the kind of the other figure in this little duo. And mm. Mark Strong is perfectly capable of handling that. Mm. Yeah, Mark yeah. Strong's a very dependable actor. I, I really like Mark Strong and I think mm. he's... You haven't seen Grimsby yet, have you? Well, I was going to say he's done some shite, but I'd say <laughs> this is uh, this is a good effort from Mark Strong. I, I, I really enjoyed him here. Mm, yeah, likewise. 
So what what is the plot? The, um, so Julianne Moore, we establishes the bad guy, and she is basically the best drug dealer in the world. Mm. But yeah. she has to live in some shitty rainforest in Bolivia or something. Campo. So she, she, <laughs> but not, but oh, she yeah. used to watch. She used to watch I Love Lucy. So she's had it turned into a kind of nineteen fifties <laughs> ghost town. No, <laughs> no. She she when she cites um, Happy Days, Greece, and or oh, something else. But which I like because it's like she's got this whole fifties thing, but it's an eighties interpretation <laughs> of the fifties, which I thought was just a, like a little detail. <laughs> they don't do much with it. Julianne Moore. It seems I I suspect she turned up on the set. Uh, and they gave her the script that day. <laughs> she certainly hadn't given any thought to what she was going to do with the character. Oh, well, I have to say I was very disappointed with the fact that Julianne Moore... To say in the first film, Samuel L. Jackson is really going for broke doing a character. You know, <laughs> he's doing an impression of Jonathan Ross, uh, who, <laughs> of course, is... I think he just had a lisp, didn't he? He didn't... Oh, was yeah. it a lisp? I think it was a lisp. Well, it was inspired by Jonathan Ross because of, um, of course, he is Jane Goldman, the writer of these films, along with Matthew Vaughan. Um, Jonathan Ross is Jane Goldman? <laughs> Jonathan Ross is Jane Goldman's husband. Oh. And, uh, of course, has met Samuel L. Jackson on a number of occasions doing, you know, press, press on various chat shows and things. So, um, apparently, he did base his villain character on Jonathan Ross. Well, he's dressed like a twat all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's just something you said to wind up Jane Goldman. I, I, I don't know. Um, but the point is, he was doing a funny voice. And he was, you know, he was making a real character out of it. And and Julianne Moore here, you know, she's chewing the scenery. She's having fun. And she's a great screen presence. But I kind of wanted more from it, you know? It, it felt just like, you mm. say, Julianne Moore with no chance to put any thought into it or do any prep. It feels like they only had her on the set for like three days, maybe. She doesn't really get out of that diner set. She doesn't uh, at all, no. She doesn't interact with any other characters until they they kind of they come to her at the end. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's very telling. And I and I think you lose something there. It's obviously just mm. presumably because of her filming schedule or whatever. But I think you lose a connection. In the first film, you know, he goes and with Samuel Jackson, they're having dinner together and stuff, and it we see that in Bond as well. That interplay between them, the cat and mouse element, is a big part of it. Like, you're mm. losing a personal element of the villain because who cares? Like what's yeah. going on with her? Yeah. Mm. Plus, what's her yeah. motivation? She's like a really good business well, person, that, yeah. but nobody knows because it's illegal, so she's annoyed. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I like her. She's she's my favorite thing in the film. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll say that. But beyond motivation, like what? What is the concept of her character? Because, as we say, when we're first introduced to her, she has her henchman throw this guy in a meat grinder that's set up at the at the side of the fucking deli counter. Not deli counter, the, the diner, diner thing, counter. Yeah. I don't think they tend to grind up meat to make <laughs> stuff in front of you when you sat there. Maybe they do. But she then turns the, the guy's flesh into like a human cheeseburger and then feeds it to the henchman who's had to go and have a pretty humiliating <laughs> makeover to kind of make him her little pawn and well, uh, put, that, you know, uh, uh, her mark on him. It, it, the whole thing's just very... That whole scene is to show her power trip kind of thing. She uh, She demands total loyalty and all this sort of thing. It's very, but then it never very comes. But that clumsy. never comes back again. Yeah, it's very, and it's just not subtle in any way. It's, it's very cartoon villain. That, mm. That's what it is. You're literally feeding someone into a giant mincer. It's a cartoon. I mean, it's Keith Allen. It's fair <laughs> enough. He deserves it. But it's it's just a ridiculous situation. And yeah, is it supposed to be funny? I don't know. I think it's dark comedy. At least there's a weird lack of um, blood. Whenever people go into that mincer, to say this is not a... there's a weird lack of clothes and bone in the burger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, even when you look at the shot of the gears from above, there's like barely any blood at all, and it's like these are pretty violent films for the most part. Mm. So it's weird that they're like clearly pulling their punches on that. But I suppose that is them going for a cartoonish quality they they know that making it too realistic would make people wince a bit and that's not what they're going for i i don't know mm. anyway julianne moore is is a very poorly defined villain that we don't know anything about and she's put some 
chemical in the world's drug supply. Is that right? Yep. All she's the marijuana, all every... the cocaine, all the heroin. Do they do they explain how she's done that? Because no, nope. because you know a lot of most people who you know a, a lot of weed is just grown by people in their own like cupboards. Well, obviously she can only do her supply, but that's she's such a canny businessman that it's getting out all over the world, isn't it? Oh, I was going to mm. say it's it's that's enough to infect basically every character we come across in the film, including <laughs> Thomas Turgus, uh, including the princess, Princess Tilde. Uh, talking about cast members, I think this is your classic thing where someone gets cast in like a little cameo role and then they decide to make a sequel, so they just luck their way into a <laughs> much bigger role than they would ever get under normal circumstances. Uh, uh, you know, nothing against Hannah Alstrom, but uh, I don't know, I can't say there's much going on in the way of chemistry, charisma, or <laughs> can, yeah, we, can we talk about that character arc? So he's we set up at the beginning. He, you know, he's falling in love with the princess because she let him fuck her up the arse. They're living together. He's worried about fitting in with her parents because they're royalty, and so it's uber posh. She's totally fine hanging out with Thomas to Goose and company. She, she's like totally chill, like she's cool with the chavs. Uh, well, she mm-hmm. obviously likes a bit of rough. We, so we have this whole thing where they go to dinner with her parents and the dad decides that the, the test of him would be to like to test his knowledge of global economics. Cl- yeah, classical literature, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. But but they do they do a kind of sitcom setup where he I mean it is it is your classic 1970s sitcom farce in fact he has an earbud in a, his ear with someone feeding him like information yeah. about everything looking it up online and then of course his mate goes into his office and finds like a bomb so he's he's there being like oh what the fuck are you doing mate to to his friend but in for the middle someone of this... who is a spy and you know has to be able to lie and and sort of finagle his way out of situations he doesn't handle that very well does he <laughs> he really doesn't because the thing to do like if you even if you can't think of anything you should be able to think of oh, i'm dreadfully sorry i'm about to shit myself and you run out of the room <laughs> <laughs> but you just you just go i'm so sorry uh i just need to get some air I'll, I'll be back in a second and and rush off and go mate what are you doing get out that's the bomb it's really important you put that down i'll i'll show you all this stuff when i get back but just for the time being don't touch anything because it might kill you i'm not kidding you know and hmm. then you go back and why don't you put a lock on that room yeah what's he doing? <laughs> so what oh yeah so the, the princess story she oh, then God, right so then he basically in the course of his duty you know, for queen and country, he has to shag somebody. It's a well-established protocol in the world of Bond. We're we're happy with it. And then he starts feeling guilty about it. And he's like, rings her up, says, sorry, love, I'm going to have to cheat on you. Sorry about that. She gets pissed off about it. And then that's a whole thing. Because then he's like... Then he half does it, but not really. But then he only does the thing he needed to do anyway. He didn't have to shag her. He only had to stick his... Oh, and also... And also, yeah, but at that point, she won't even take his calls and hear him go, look, all I did was snog her and put my finger up her vagina. Um, you know, what? the point that made me question to what extent Matthew Vaughan is self-aware and is making a comedy and the, the extent to which he doesn't know what he's doing. When she says, do you want to piss on me? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was specifically the point where we follow Taron Egerton's finger with this sort of oh, yeah. <laughs> device on it. And the camera kind of swooshes up between her legs, fades to black, and then we cut to a CGI rendering of inside her pelvic walls, <laughs> inside her, like, I mean, what what would you call that? A cervix? Uh-huh. Is that what that is? <laughs> yeah. It, as this little device is floating up. It, that was when I was like, right, what what is this? Because this... <laughs> This is. Does it actually beep like a submarine sonar? Is that was that just in my imagination? <laughs> this is something that feels like it should be in Crank Three, you know? Yeah. Not a not a mainstream. <laughs> that's what I want. Kingsman film. That that whole sequence was bizarre. But again, it's like I say, that's something you do in Kingsman Five once mm. you've established that it, 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 to do the whole James Bond deconstruction thing. We have to establish that Eggsy is, you know, out and about getting laid all the time. And, 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 and then there are some actual interesting things to explore there. If he is James Bond and he's being asked to give that up for, you know, this woman he cares about, that's interesting. 
But instead, what we get is, as far as we know, she's the first woman he's ever slept with. Is that right? Does he sleep with anyone else in the first Kingsman? Uh, no. For all we know, he lost his virginity to her, and he mm. doesn't, you know, <sighs> have any confidence and doesn't dare step outside of his comfort zone and and i mean obviously the implication is there but it just doesn't play the way it's mm. clearly supposed to and and i think that's a an odd decision on on the part of the filmmakers really i was thinking that you know he's like oh he's got after shag this girl but he's got to lie to her he's got to you know like make her think that he actually wants her and then and i thought oh in this day and age you can't really do that it's too mm. creepy it's too sexual assaulty so they've come up with a plot device so that he doesn't have to do it and he can kind of walk away without it, without it looking like too kind of SJW kind yeah. of feel to it. No, he still does it. <laughs> it just doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because the princess agrees to it, it so long as he proposes marriage to her. Yeah! She, she what was, the yeah. fuck is yeah. that? That was really strange. That pissed me off and, and I could tell that, like I could feel Alan seething when I watched it. <laughs> because, yeah, the notion that well, I don't really want you sleeping with other people, but if we're married, it's all right, because that means stability. Does it? <laughs> yeah. You know, d- like, does it? it? That's not... Oh, this weird, antiquated view of fucking marriage. I'm s- fucking sick of it. I hate marriage. <laughs> <laughs> marriage is, is absolute meaningless fucking twaddle. It's a piece of paper. There's arguably some minor tax reasons in favour of doing it, but, you know, it, it's certainly, there's nothing to stop you breaking up with someone mm. yeah. if you're married to them. Unless you're, like, a, a billionaire and they're not, in which case there might be some financial implications. But for the average person on the street, I I can't imagine any of that's coming into play between uh, Eggsy and the princess. Or or if it is, it's kind of going the other way, you know? Well, yeah, he's obviously the one who's going to be marrying into wealth. Mm. So, you know, he needs to log that shit down. You know, you can... <laughs> Once he's in, like, yeah, just try and divorce me. I'll I'll take you from there. <laughs> I imagine Eggsy's paid very well for being a Kingsman. I bet it's a very high-paying job. Oh, I don't know. Secret Service people don't get paid that well. Uh, well, it might. Well, yeah, maybe it's all benefits. It's all the benefits you've got to kind of, you know. Oh, but saying that, actually, all your, all your expenses and things. They are a private uh, company, aren't they? They're not like government sanctioned or anything. So exactly, exactly, and they're they're clearly um, they're all about you know having money for the better things and blah 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 yeah yeah it's it's murder to pass the job interview <laughs> literally in some cases <laughs> oh. you've got to murder a dog you've got to make sure you're not murdered there's all sorts of murder <laughs> i'd expect that Exley's on a good like minimum minimum 60 grand a year i would say although to be honest maybe they've just plucked this uh working class oi cup knowing they can give him like 18 grand and he'll think that's a jackpot <laughs> i imagine a lot will be on expenses yeah, yeah but that's what i mean i'm i reckon he's on 60 grand a year but he gets about a million in expenses <laughs> with all the with all those suits and private jet use i don't think he owns that, that house either i think he's just that's a, like a company yeah, house yeah. he's allowed to live there while he's working yeah and the cars and things that's it i think they really take care of you that's Colin Firth's character's house from the the last one. Well, exactly. He's just passed it on. It's a company right, house. Yeah. So if he if he quits, <laughs> he has to give it up. So they introduce this whole marriage thing, and it I, I, it seems to exist purely to sort of give us a happy ending, I guess, and to show that Eggsy's relationship with the princess is escalating. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really have much bearing on where the story goes <laughs> next. I cannot remember the last time I watched the film, and I so blatantly saw the pieces being laid out in the script (laughs) when they introduced that i was like right so that's yeah so he's gonna he's gonna not quite sleep with her but they're gonna break up over it then she's gonna find out that actually he does love her after all he's gonna propose after all and they're gonna Mm. get married at the end okay i i see what this is um shall we talk about we we haven't really talked about the well the major selling point of the film actually which is the whole idea of the american kingsman the statesman and we get introduced mm. to a whole new cast of characters through that device because obviously the kingsman now led by michael gambon for a bizarre small part uh but they're all offed, and so Eggsy and Mark Strong have to go over to america to join up with the the team over there led by jeff bridges mm. Yeah, I. So we're introduced to a new set of cast members, like you say, Jeff Bridges doing a very um, Jeff Bridges role. 
<laughs> I love Jeff Bridges, but there he was just great. something about what he was doing here that I didn't like, and I don't know what it was. Mm. It, it was like it was like his mouth. It's like it felt like he'd just been to the dentist, <laughs> and then they'd filmed his scenes, and his mouth was like paralyzed still with some anaesthetic. I was wondering if it was because he didn't have his beard in this one, and I'm used to him with sort of a bit more of a <laughs> that beard. Might be it. A very weak jaw without his beard. Yeah. I think that is it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. How amazing uh, would it have been if they'd had Jeff Bridges doing that but dressed as Colonel Sanders? <laughs> <laughs> I would actually have loved that. He practically was. <laughs> <laughs> they have Channing Tatum picking up the uh the playing men with stripper names thing from Magic Mike, uh playing a guy called Tequila. Well yeah, all the American agents are named after uh all types of alcohol. Like um yeah. That felt so clunky. And... It doesn't even gel with like, because the Kingsmen are, it's all like King Arthur and Lancelot and all that yeah. kind of stuff. It makes no sense. I'd, I'd be fine if the Kingsmen were named after like Taylors or something or whatever. Yeah, but it's, it's a James Bond trope, isn't it? Because James Bond is a code name, well established. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> in this state, they're, play- they're paying homage to James Bond. They're like, look, we've got, everyone's got code names. Mm. You're not going to use your real name if you're doing undercover espionage. That's just fucking stupid. <laughs> So, uh, but I agree. It just, it just doesn't, it, it felt like they should all be named after like famous whiskey distilleries. Yeah. Not just, you know, types of alcohol. Yeah, but then they'd all be called Glenn. <laughs> yeah, but that'd be fine. <laughs> and then, yeah, Jeff Bridges is called like Jack Daniels or whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, so Channing Tatum's here in a bizarrely small part as well. I do get the feeling that someone just put word out to casting agents like who's got a couple of days free and we will just figure out a way to put them in so that they can be on the poster because julianne yeah. moore jeff bridges channing tatum we will write the script around you we don't care about the story or structure it felt like they did that it felt like who's free and wants to be set up for kingsman 3 mm. when we'll we'll make sure we've got funding in place to secure you properly <laughs> like Halle berry's here as well uh, sort of playing the uh, yeah. the American Merlin role. It felt like the script was probably written with Channing Tatum playing a guy who it turned out was the villain, mm. and that was the way it worked. But instead, he's playing a guy who's a good guy, but then there's another guy who's basically the same character, yeah. kind of stocky, thick, with two Cs, cowboy. Yeah, definitely that was, that was written as one character. <laughs> and then it's just like, yeah. look, Channing Tatum <laughs> can't do the whole thing. Pedro Pascal, Who? You know, he was in Game of Thrones. Uh, whatever. Is he available? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Can he yeah. grow a moustache? Because that whole bit doesn't quite work. Like, if you had Channing Tatum in those scenes where they go to Glastonbury, it makes more sense because otherwise it's just like yeah. this 50-year-old man trying to pick up this 20-year-old girl. Uh, and <laughs> it, it doesn't quite play, even in the world of They Game do Bond. get a joke out of you know, with her immediately rejecting yeah. him for being too old. I agree, it would have made far more sense if it was Channing Tatum trying it on with her. And Well, that whole sort of weird tangent at Glastonbury felt very strange and out of place in the film. I mean, first of all, I don't think they're actually filming at Glastonbury. It looks like just a field somewhere where they put a tent and a <laughs> bar. So you don't get... You know, I, I would have assumed that the novelty of going there would have been to film, like, at an actual Glastonbury festival and maybe do some stuff. Yeah. But they, they don't, so... So it's just really strange. Well, I, I think what probably happened was um, they they probably thought, well, we need to have a scene, a seduction scene, James Bond style. <laughs> oh, but that's going to be a bit icky and, and, you know, that's not going to play well in the current climate and things have changed. Well, what about if, uh, you know, it's a music festival and therefore it's believable that she's just like off her tits and gagging for it and initiating the whole thing and i think it was a very half heart my, my guess is it's a very kind of half assed <laughs> attempt at writing around those things it doesn't really yeah what, what happens at glasto mm. stays at glasto she's in the mood um they they could make more of an effort when bond seduces a lady it, it feels believable usually uh in mm. some some sometimes okay just it's pretty rough but for the most part it's like okay it's a cool suave guy in the cool suave environment but like this they he just wanders up and he's like all right love i really liked the <laughs> fact that they they did your classic you know wingman thing of have the guy go in as a kind of decoy and then the other guy can come in and kind of snipe him down yeah. that's obviously not the intention of the characters at the time but 
I didn't buy. They were obviously going for a kind of Eggsy's young and hip, and he's one of the Utes, and she's responding to that vibe. But it just didn't play because I just don't. Maybe I'm completely wrong here, but I don't buy that that character, as played by Poppy, would interact with this guy who talks like Ali G, and <laughs> who's dressed in like a fucking spandex tracksuit, whatever it was he was in. It just didn't. I mean, maybe that's the appeal of Glasto. I don't know, but it it just seemed to me like maybe this is where Eggsy has to put on a bit of that suave Bond charm and. The best thing it would have been if he's just doing, like, he goes, uh, oh, I'll just do an impression of that Charlie guy. And then he's, like, going, like, oh, hi, hi, darling, how's it going? <laughs> exactly, exactly. You a Libra? <laughs> <laughs> or they write something into the script where, do they establish they've broken up or something? Or they're, they're on, you know, thin ice and something she's like looking for... Well, he's travelling to Cambodia all the time to pick up a new <laughs> robot arm. So they, if they write something in, like, you know... She's looking for a specific reason to get back at him for something. Oh, it's you, the the rival recruit from that job he went up for. <laughs> I know what'll piss him off. The whole film just it, it just doesn't quite none of it quite works, does it? Mm. We I think we've already established it at this point, but it's worth noting that Julianne Moore, super villain took advantage of the the confusion of the previous film where Samuel L. Jackson had kidnapped a load of celebrities um, <laughs> or had lured them onto his island or whatever the hell it was in order to kidnap Elton John, which is weird because he's not even part of the 1950s nostalgia. I guess, I guess he was kind of doing 50s-inspired music in the 80s, is that? I'm guessing that's what they're going for, because he he was sort of like a classic, you know, he he grew up on rock and roll and stuff, and he liked that kind mm. of 50s sound and was very inspired by it, so I'm guessing that's what they're going for. I'm Cliff pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> and like the big bopper was dead. It would have made more sense to go for Buddy Holly or something, but they're, they're all but dead. But th- this is, Elton John is probably mates with Matthew Vaughan. I mean, certainly they went on to make the Elton John film and Taron Egerton obviously starred as Elton John. So again, I'm just ge- I'm just assuming that, oh yeah, let's just have Elton in it because it's funny. And uh, I'm sure that they talked it is. about it. We, uh. we learned that uh, lesson back when The Country Bears came out uh, in 2003 <laughs> or whatever it was. Which just has gratuitous uh, Elton John cameo sequences for no reason. <laughs> I think my initial response is, this is stupid, it's shit. Mm. But I kind of, I I like that they keep coming back to it and they incorporate them into the story in quite a nice way. Like into how the action unfolds and stuff. I think it might have worked better if Elton John could act in any way. That would be yeah, helpful. Yeah, that was the problem for me yeah. um but i think I in like theory it's a kind it of running gag yeah. and... and then but they it's not just coming back to it they make it work with the dog robot thing like it, they, they make a, a thing hmm. of it i think it would have been funnier like yeah number one if it was someone who could act uh number two if it was someone a bit more i think elton john's known for having a a sense of fun and being willing to do this yeah. sort of thing and i think it'd be funnier if it was someone a bit stuffier and less known for playing himself in stupid films like the country <laughs> bears <laughs> but i guess they also get a, a great song on the soundtrack out of it but then the problem is there's a the most it, like cringy part of the film is the self-indulgent bending over backwards oh wednesday night's all right oh isn't that song called saturday night's all right for fighting Yes, but today is Wednesday, and I'm going to fight you today. <laughs> but it's the daytime, and the song says it's night time. <laughs> well, we're going to ignore that in- <laughs> this, that discrepancy, because this joke's only got time to address one. I think he should have picked up a crocodile-shaped rock and smashed it in the head of it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, like that joke was that joke was appalling because just have him sing Wednesday nights all right and then smack the guy and you get the joke. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you yeah. either get the joke, you either know Elton John's catalogue well enough to get that, or you don't know it and therefore you don't want 
to hear a joke about one of his songs. It, it's and yeah, like you say, if they were gonna do it, I felt like they could have lent into it a bit more. You know, gone full Bill Murray and Zombieland again. There's a lot of Zombieland comparisons to be drawn between Kingsman Two and uh, mm. Zombieland. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> I do um like Elton John being in this. I think I think we might have said like on the first film. It's a shame that Samuel Jackson is making a point of going around and re- either recruiting or capturing all of these celebrities, but we don't actually see anyone yeah. you know there's like a Barack They're Obama standing from, from yeah. yeah from behind or whatever but that's about as as far as it goes and um, I like that it sort of makes good on that it's weird um, and I like him and Ju- again I really I like him and Julianne Moore a lot in this I just wish everything else around them made more sense of them isn't it weird that the the president certainly has all the behaviors of a of a um Trump right wing uh conservative president in in this film mm. suggesting that the Republican party did in this universe win the election after Obama was assassinated <laughs> yeah i don't know it it just i think generally an assassination does a lot for your political party in terms of people tend to be more on your side because it's like well yes oh, but fuck that's not on that you got assassinated but then i suppose that it would come out that obama was trying to run yeah. off to some little island and well no he was in he was in his bunker his head exploded because he uh, quite happily took the samuel L. jackson mm, he was in mm. on the whole sort of kill the plebs sort yeah, of thing and yeah but then it's weird that it's not just donald trump I, but I do think it is interesting, and it probably speaks to Matthew Vaughan's whole libertarian sort of uh, leaning, I guess, that we had the Democratic president there, and here we are clearly a Republican president, um, and both are sort of treated uh, with a similar level of disdain. In the first film, it's blatantly meant to be Obama, mm. whereas in this film, it's just generic white guy. Yeah. And and I guess, you know, it, it would be a distraction to have Donald Trump or a Donald Trump impersonator in the film, but it was a distraction to have a guy who looks like Obama in the first film. Like, mm. do you know what I mean? It doesn't. Yeah. I and and I don't think, to be honest, I don't think it would be remotely beyond the world of this film to have one of those really good Donald Trump impersonators doing their, you know, get Alec Baldwin in, <laughs> get the guy who did it in Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt in. Mm. It would have been to be, it would have been quite funny, I think, to have him be like, "We just won the war on drugs," and do the exact same scenes. But <laughs> we've got Emily Watson in these scenes, bizarre, yeah, yeah. well, uh, a really good that? actress. What's that about, yeah, what's she? Do? What's happened to her career then? <laughs> well, it's it's gone strength to strength. She did Chernobyl like last year. Really good in this. that. Yeah, I think she's a phenomenal actress. Uh, but she, uh, I don't know why she's here. Uh, she has like two scenes. And then she's in probably the worst bit of CG in the entire thing when she's led into a cage in a stadium <laughs> and like drones are flying around. Oh, it's terrible. That was another bit when I thought, what is like, at what level is this being? Picked? Because that <laughs> yeah. that struck me like this is like a Justin Roiland cartoon. This is like the sort of insane shit I would want to put in a film, but I wouldn't be able to figure out a way to make it make sense in a way <laughs> that was remotely viable and I would never get around to actually writing it down because it was too absurd. But what because it, it, it's just it's just a load of people in little cages being stacked like Lego bricks and <laughs> dancing like mad in each But thing. I don't it's what just... what is the actual like on a practical level, why are they doing that? <laughs> like the government or whatever. Why why are they stacking them in cages, individual cages like that? <laughs> Like what's well, the it's meant to be some kind of quarantine, but they've forgotten that they've all taken drugs. It's not like an infectious disease they're dealing yeah. with. They're not zombies. So, yeah, just put them in a fucking jail cell if you're worried about them dancing on the streets, causing too much chaos. Yeah, I think it's supposed to show the scale of the situation, how many people are affected by what's going What? How, how many are there? 2,000? Because if you're Probably just going to put them in a fo- football stadium, why don't you put them in the seats? Because that's what seats are there. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're fun. dancing. Well, let them dance on the pitch instead of building cages on them. I don't what, know. What I don't bothered know what me? I what bothered me is that... 
<laughs> at the end, when the antidote is being uh, distributed, and it's this really... Well, okay, we need to get it out there quick. How, how do we write this? Oh, yes, they're all attached to drones all around the world, and at the press of a button, they'll all be released. These still must be administered, sort of like someone needs to pour the antidote down someone's <laughs> mouth sort of thing. And someone is presumably doing that, because the next time we see Emily Watson, someone's, like, taken the cage down, and presumably these are all, like... Government yeah, because lest we forget, or... if if you haven't seen the film in a while or you haven't seen it, stage two of this uh, infection from taking tainted drugs is you dance uncontrollably and presumably are not in a you know you're also like insane and completely delirious and can't speak, so you're presumably not in a position of being able to administer medication both physically and mentally. Stage three is full on muscular paralysis where you absolutely would not be able to administer medication to yourself. So yeah, it's stupid. Mm. Well, that's why all the lonely people die. (laughs) Stage four is your eyes explode. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And again, like everyone, like uh, Thomas Turgoose and um, Eggsy's other mate, um, at the end, he's like pouring the thing down his... How did he get it? Like, where did these... It's just really... The knocked on the door. (laughs) said, I heard you've you've got a paralysis in your house. Look, Pizza yeah. Hut can deliver pizzas with drones in some country now, so, you know. But how would they know? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's all just <laughs> really <laughs> contrived nonsense just to sort of, you know, um, yeah. skirt over any kind of uh, yeah. logistics. Yeah, they should have shown, uh, like, the princesses, like, you know, someone rushing it on a motorbike straight to their home. And then Thomas Tagusa's mate is in a big queue at the local pharmacy. They're all waiting to get it. And the person behind him is like tapping on the shoulder. Excuse me, I've got three kids that all take drugs and they're going to die. Can I go ahead of you, please? They're really really bad. And there's also people picketing outside the queues, uh, protesting for their right to die of tainted... (laughs) No, protesting their their right to die of tainted drugs and not be made to take a vaccine. (laughs) even though it's um, an optional thing at that point that no one's been talking about forcing them to take anyway. <laughs> it it felt very similar to the first film's evil plan of uh, everyone... You know, the first one is everyone uses a mobile phone that emits a signal that makes them go into rage zombie mode. And this one is everyone, it turns out, takes drugs and therefore is infected with blue veins that make you dance like a madman and then die so am i am i very just uncool and kind of out of loops because this film certainly makes it out like pretty much everyone does some kind of recreational drug um and presumably they do it or everyone does it regularly because everyone's getting ill at the same time um (laughs) who's everyone though all we see is we've got Thomas well, Tegu is huffing Turk on a is... crack pipe, and that's sort of in keeping with their character. Um, the princess. Yeah, the princess. I, I totally buy all the royals, yeah. all the upper class people in the world are, you know, shooting Doing up ketamine. And, and, all, yeah. Yeah. Um, and who Channing else? Channing Tatum. Some people, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. well, obviously a party boy. Emily Watson. Yeah, she's a politician at the highest level doing 80 hour weeks. That's... Yeah. Uh, and no, uh, I... people, at, people at Glasto as well, who, of course, are... Lots of people at Glasto. Well, yeah. Yeah, but they are, you know, you go around the festival and there are people just on the floor within like the first yeah. hour. I, I think we'd probably be safe, the three of us. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. but that that's what this film was missing, wasn't it? It was the shot of three fucking knobheads sat in their bedroom <laughs> on a Zoom call <laughs> while everyone else is outside, like, dancing. <laughs> <laughs> It's so strange because it doesn't make any real stance on a kind of anti-drug or pro-drug rhetoric, does it? I mean, it kind of anything. It's sort of saying like, "Hey, it's not that bad," you know. Doing drugs is all right. It dabbles into making a point about alcohol being every bit as bad a drug and something that's inexplicably. Does it though? Because we see we see them drinking very heavily throughout. I mean, I'm <laughs> they do drink a lot. Even when they're just about to go to work, like they they knock one back just to make sure, and then like at the end, isn't it with Channing Tatum? They say, "Oh, just stick to the booze, will you, mate?" Yeah, I think it's a very pro alcohol film. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, they had a tie in alcohol. <laughs> oh really? Is that a real alcohol? You could get a Kingsman whiskey for a while. You probably still can. When you say you could, Calvin, 
Well, okay. well, I don't know. I don't know. No, no, I, don't, I don't know actually how much um, it went for. Let me see if... Have they ever done a Bond alcohol? Well, I mean, the Bond has a lot of... Doesn't Bond drink Heineken or some he shit? He does. Beer and, and... <laughs> yeah, so that's all. You just need to grab a can of Heineken. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, I mean come on. Heineken. <laughs> I mean, that is selling out. James Bond, who's obsessed with, like, having proper, the best things in life, and then he's drinking a fucking can of Heineken. I mean, it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a tin of Foster's, but... Yeah, but it's just, it's whatever, whoever pays. It's like when in the, when it was Timothy Dalton, he was driving a Ford Capri, because it was like, that was who was paying. Mm-hmm. We're saying Bond has no, no morals and scruples. <laughs> Yeah, I can't find a price for this whiskey, but it's 1991 vintage, this one that I'm looking at. So it is presumably Ooh. quite expensive if that's the vintage. Yeah. Um, they were really thinking ahead with this merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> they they couldn't get any tie-in cocaine manufacturers to like agree to <laughs> make the Kingsman official cocaine then. <laughs> so they came, they went harsh on them. I I don't know. I I feel like there is a bit of a sentiment from the the fact that Julianne Moore is the villain and and yeah. she's sort of like she makes the point of look what I do is no worse than what you do and you've just legalized it. But then I guess mm. they never really go that extra mile of making her a sympathetic villain. They kind of give her a speech that you kind of think like yeah that's fair enough. But then <laughs> she has people being cooked into burgers. Emily Watson plays that part in a scene mm. with the president where she's like, yeah, talk yeah. to functioning professionals yeah. and whatnot. I mean, look, I, I feel like I've been incredibly negative about this film mm-hmm. because it is a total fucking clusterfuck and messy and all that stuff. I, I have to say, I I would struggle to make a big distinction in quality terms between this and the first one. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, I disagree. I think I think this is <laughs> this is all the worst elements of the first film ramped up, which is why I think it's just Matthew Vaughn let off the leash. See, I I think I like that more. I like seeing an auteur, which is what I think. It, you know, I think Matthew Vaughn is very much an auteur filmmaker. I like seeing an auteur let off the leash and just doing whatever the fuck they want. To be honest, I think I find that more interesting than seeing them try to fit into something commercially viable awkwardly. So, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just looking here, and Alan, you gave this film a 3 out of 10 mm-hmm. back in our review of the year 2017 episode, episode 83 mm. uh, of the podcast, if anyone wants to go back and listen to that. Calvin, you gave it a 7 out of 10. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely coming down on the more positive Calvin side of things with this one. Mm. Although, Calvin, if you rewatched the first one and decided you don't like it nearly as much, has that tainted your opinion of this one as well? well or I think in my previous, in, in the previous uh, review we did of this, I think I talked about preferring this one to the first one. I think I still do, bizarrely. Uh, and I think I, I get that. I do get that. I, I yeah, I get that. I don't really know why, um, but I think it's more fun. I, I think the first film is like I say, it's Matthew Vaughan trying to fit into something that adheres to what we think of being a an acceptable film to release in cinemas for the masses. <laughs> Whereas this film is just it it's not remotely concerned with how things are gonna go down with a mainstream audience. It's just throwing robot dogs at the screen and yeah. dancing plagues. It's just it's so much more bizarre and unhinged and i think that can if you're attuned in a certain way make for a more enjoyable experience i i totally get that i think uh, i think Sol did sum it up quite well in articulating why i might like i don't like it but i think i enjoy it it's weird mm. uh there's yeah. so much really stupid maybe this is like how you feel when we watch some of the bond films well no actually you don't enjoy it um <laughs> uh um, uh, but yeah, I, I guess I enjoyed the viewing experience, and I really like Julianne Moore uh, in it. I, I quite like Elton John. Some of the action's all right, if cartoony and video gamey. It's weird political mixed messages from Matthew Vaughan, as is his style. Uh, I think I'm gonna give it a six, which I guess is downgrading. Uh, yeah, it's a step down. So. Yeah, I I think given. Given what they've got here, the ingredients, the people involved, the money, I don't think they could possibly have made a worse film. 
I think this is as bad <laughs> as it possibly could have been. And I do appreciate oh, that's some of that. Not true at all. It, some of that is really kind of. I guess it just pushes my buttons in a in a negative way. It kind of has all the elements I don't like about action sequences, about just don't give a toss character stuff. So given like what they had, and you know, like I say, the first one was fine. Uh, I think a three is 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 fair. I think I'll stick with that. Hmm. Okay. Well, I never thought I'd be in this position, but I mean, look, I I am. Um, I didn't watch this film when it came out. I only watched it yesterday. I I wasn't that enamored with the first film, and I I think people liking it as much as it as they did perhaps even put me off it a bit. So I I was in no rush to get around to watching the second one. And I kind of forgot it was there, and then at a certain point I knew that we'd probably be covering it on this podcast, so I just saved it. And I sat down to watch it yesterday, and and I don't know, it just I wasn't expecting to enjoy it, I think, and I did. I really enjoyed it, I thought it was really good fun. Basically everything I got out of the first film, but with the weird political undertones perhaps... Um, lessened a bit you know I, I felt like some of the sharper corners have been sanded down so to speak just you know perhaps not intentionally but they weren't dealing with a, a working class kid being plucked off the streets and things like that so it was just inherently playing in a safer sandpit yeah i, I don't know i i i had a really good time enjoy uh watching it i i'd struggle to make any massive distinction between this and the first film in terms of quality. I, I think obviously there are some messy elements that we've gone into, but on the whole, I, I had a good time watching it. I gave it a 7 out of 10, same as the first one. Hmm. Well. Wow. See, I'd probably downgrade the first one to a 5 now. Hmm. I think Matthew Vaughan might be my least favourite director working at the moment. You say that about a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. And I think really on a kind of on a personal level, I think he makes things... Whether he makes them well or not, I think he makes things that I don't like. The, the, his style I don't like, regardless of any kind of real mm. talent, you know what I mean? I think that uh, I, I think he did one of the best X-Men films with First Class, and I, I, I need to go back and watch Kick-Ass mm. and Stardust. I remember really liking Stardust. I must say, when I, when I last watched uh, Kick-Ass, which to be fair was about eight years ago now with Alan in the room, which probably <laughs> wasn't great, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did feel like, oh, the... Uh, the, this has really lost its sheen. I'm really not getting what I got out of this the first time round. Yeah, I feel... Didn't hold up at all. Yeah, I but feel... But when, uh, when we went back to X-Men First Class for our X-Men podcast episode a while back, I, I thought it did stand up remarkably well, and I really enjoyed it, so... But I guess that's going to be him sort of with, like, execs over his shoulder on the set and stuff, and, like, right, we've yeah. locked off this script, you're doing this script, and, you know, it's probably him at his most tethered, I guess. Um, but now yeah. he seems to have pretty much dedicated himself solely to Kingsman, considering that... The King's Man is baffling. also him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, and he's and he's talking about it setting up Kingsman three, and yeah, it's very weird yeah. to say he didn't even bother directing Kick Ass two. Yeah, so he's not had a real interest in franchise filmmaking. He didn't come back for the X Men sequel after First Class, though. That might be because the execs wanted Brian Singer back instead of him. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, it's it's very weird that this is the franchise he's set his heart on mm. but it does feel a bit like a guy who had a few good ideas and he's done them all he's done all three ideas and so now he's just got to stick on that last idea and ride it out like james cameron with avatar mm. man of great ideas but he did them all all right well i'll just make 10 more of these well, <laughs> until it, i die it that... is probably sort of like he is probably a given so much freedom because he's writing producing directing these things and they are they are successes mm. uh so he probably does just have a lot of freedom and i guess it's probably more mm. maybe it's more exciting to be doing that than something else where someone's going to uh yeah be giving you notes mm. on the set but yeah they've got the king's man which is a prequel which is what we're sort of leading up to and then mm. there's kingsman 3 and and then they were talking about doing a statesman film as well, where it was going to be oh, all the God. Americans. Because, well, we didn't actually really that would talk make about sense, the... But, like, you just let an American guy direct it and just let him go off in a totally different direction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't imagine Matthew Vaughan's going to make Statesman. I imagine that would be more of a spin-off with a different mm. creative team. He'd be, like, a producer on it. We didn't really mention this about the end of the Golden Circle, but it does set up, like, Channing... T the ending is Channing Tatum getting out of a taxi in London and walking into the Kingsman shop. I suppose it was implying that Eggsy's walked away from it and 
uh, what's his name's gonna be uh, Channing Tatum's gonna be in that mm. role, which is really uh, weird and not something that anyone asked for. Later, if they want to, he's come over on a you know work transfer thing. Well, it's it's didn't he look uncomfortable in a suit? Just didn't. It's too Oof. bulky. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Daniel Craig. Just doesn't fit in a suit. He's used to wearing suits designed to be ripped off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Velcro was popping. <laughs> yeah. Right, I, I have a couple of points to hit now. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do now. This is a complete and utter tangent that's got nothing to do with anything. It's vaguely Bond related. But uh, we, we received quite a nice email the other day. Uh, I would just like to... Oh. We, we rarely bother uh, reading emails out on the show, but I thought I'd make uh, an exception here <laughs> uh, on the next record with both of you present. Uh, William Fletcher uh, sent us an email. Hmm. I, I guess I'll just read that out. Hello, Sol or Alan. Uh, first up, so not you, Calvin. Yeah. You're left out of this. It's Sol. Sol deals with the emails. <laughs> first off, I just want to say that I have absolutely loved the podcast for the past two years. I, I started listening about Aww. April. That's how you get read out on the show. <laughs> Let's put that. In the email. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I started listening about April 2018. I started off with the Bond episodes because that's what I was oh, interested. Because that's what interested me. I started listening more and more to the other episodes, and I have just enjoyed every episode I've listened to. So thank you very much, William. That's nice of you. That's so lovely. However, I am also sending this email as I decided to do something interesting. I wanted to know how many tens were given at this point. I then wanted to know how many ones have been given at this point. (laughs) And he is attached, Alan. You'll like this. He's made two um, pie charts laying out (laughs) Uh, every time a 10 out of 10 score and a 1 out of 10 score has been given on this show. Excellent. Uh, And uh, I, I guess we'll have to post these up on, on social media at some point after this drops. Okay. Yeah. At this point, 54 tens have been given and 33 <gasps> ones have been given. That's a lot. Yeah. Sol has given the most tens with 29. Wow, that's over half. Oh. Yeah. Well, do, bear in mind, Alan, you and I are on uh, 200 and something episodes of this show, whereas <laughs> Calvin's on about 150 yeah. <laughs> or something. So. <laughs> Um, so really, it's between me and you, I think. But <laughs> yeah, Sol is given the most tens with twenty nine. Behind Sol is Calvin with thirteen uh, tens given, and Alan with seven. <laughs> so even <laughs> even in spite of he's still given nearly twice as many ten out of tens. <laughs> I want to know what films these are now. Uh, Darren, Gareth, Howard, and Emily have each given one ten out of ten. Oh, wow. Uh, I'll just keep reading out. I was going to see if I should make a game of it, but I can't be asked. It's too hot. <laughs> Sol is also given the most ones with 15. Okay. So I'm, I'm obviously the most extreme, the most <laughs> emotional out of the two of us. You're more set in the middle. Uh, Alan is given the second most with 10. Yeah. Okay. So you've, you're, you know, <laughs> statistically it makes sense now. They're all Bond films, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Calvin is given five. Oh. Scott has given two. <laughs> That's amazing. How many episodes was Scott on? He's only done about three episodes. Three? <laughs> but we did we did cover the Halloween sequels, to be fair, in one of them. So that's, that'll be Halloween 6 and uh, one of the other ones, I'm guessing. I hated listening to that episode. <laughs> <laughs> Gareth has, uh, has given one. Uh, this was something interesting I wanted to do, and I thought it would be fun to share. Say hello to Os Ten Powers and Japanese Bond for me. <laughs> Thank you for this podcast for the past two years. So thanks again, William. Uh, really nice getting that. Lovely. And uh, we'll he knows his stuff. <laughs> we'll post them up, I guess. Like I say, excellent, nice one. Yeah. And uh, if if you listening have got uh, any other little projects or things or just messages you want to send us. Um, Especially things that say how great we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the email address is dimreturnspodcast at gmail.com. You can also, of course, reach us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I think if you just search diminishing... At dimreturnspod. If you just search diminishing returns podcast, it'll probably bring us up, but it might bring up another show <laughs> with the same name. <laughs> so be careful. And the other thing... Um, is just that I, I, I really wanted to drill into the fact that this is a James Bond comparison. So we're back on Kingsman now, off the okay. tangent. I just wanted to talk about how this relates to James Bond, because I I find James Bond so boring. <laughs> every, James, every James Bond film I've seen, 
which is pretty much all of the pre Craig ones at this point. Yeah. They're just boring. They're just like yeah. yeah, and but Kingsman is like so not boring because it's just people doing silly, stupid shit and it's fun and engaging. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I don't know if I'm asking are these doing James Bond better than Bond? Or is this very much some of the fallout of the Daniel Craig films being so good that it's kind of leaving room for lesser imitators in in their wake. I, I, I don't know. I, I was just interested to hear your guys' thoughts on how this fits into the 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 Bond franchise, well, the cinema landscape with James Bond being there. How you think they compare? Well, certainly the first one was uh, done in a response, and uh, Matthew Vaughan and Mark Miller have talked about this, w- was uh, an immediate response to the Daniel Craig Bond films, which are much more down-to-earth and far less silly, or at least started that way, than a lot of the older Bond films, most of which we've seen. Whether or not you find them boring or not, a lot of the concepts in them are quite outrageous and silly, even if they play it a bit straighter for you know Mm. for instance and i think kingsman was a response to that or at least it was a response to what matthew vaughan and mark miller's memories were of like some of the sean connery ones and roger moore and some of the campier elements and i think in their heads they were kind of taking some of those more outrageous ideas and trying to do a modern version of that at least i think that's Mm. what the first one started out as it didn't quite work and i think we talked about this because of like there are a level of violence that the bond films would never actually do and um, and these political messages and whatnot, um, and they're they're also consciously subverting Bond in certain ways, which is. Mm. You've just reminded me of something there, Calvin. And I'm taking us back slightly, which I forgot to mention is just how much this film enjoys violence, mm. relishes yeah, it, yeah. and it, it actually was left a bit of a. I can't remember if the first film's the same, but it did leave a bad taste. The first in my one's mouth. worse from what it I really remember. enjoys violence, like yeah, I, to I the agree. point where I was like, whoever wrote this could could probably do with some therapy. I think they might need a bit of help. <laughs> well, I think it's whoever directed it, really, because you can write it and do it in such a way. I guess in the script it just says they have a fight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but no, mm. I, I completely agree with you. But I think it's far more pronounced in the first film. I, I think the first one left a bad taste in my mouth. I, that that church scene in particular, I remember really leaving a bad yeah, taste in my mouth. Yeah, yeah, um, right, yeah. Because it's so viscerally violent. Even though it is kind of heightened and silly, it's shot in quite a brutal, real way. In certain regards, anyway. And the characters are essentially innocent. You know, I I think the film establishes that they're racist or something before beating the shit out of them, but they're, you know, I, I don't know, it just, this second film, I think, didn't bother me nearly as much because the violence is all between secret agents who kind of sign up for a certain job and mm. know what they're getting into, so it's not nearly the same kind of thing. Mm. You know, it, it's, it, it's it still, still quite... takes a, a a great glee in it. You know, it's, mm. it's, yeah, it, it enjoys it. Anyway, I think you know, in terms of its connection with Bond, is it more of a response to Johnny English? I think so. They've thought, <laughs> they've thought, well, let's do Johnny English, but uh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Why would you think so? I, I mean, right now, basically, I'm, I'm interested just because right now, I think I have both of these films pegged higher in my mind than any James Bond film I've seen. <laughs> <sighs> and I, and I, I'd, I'd, stop, I'd stop short of saying they're better films. I think the second Kingsman film is better than 95% of the James Bond films I've seen. There's there's one or two that I'd probably put above it, but I think I think I'd probably say the first Kingsman's better than any of the James Bond films I've seen. I'd have to rewatch Doctor No and Goldfinger, but all right. Well, that's that. Uh, <laughs> Not impressed. No, you, I mean we definitely didn't need to end this podcast this way. We, we we were wrapping up. We could have just finished, but no. We could have ended your friendship this way. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, you. I mean, you are wrong. But where do you think these sit then, when compared again? If you were to I don't rank know what you mean Bond by where film, do these sit. Uh, if you ranked every Bond film in order, best to worst, mm. and then you put Kingsman in there as if it were a James Bond film. Well, it's. It, would it be in the top half? The bottom 
bottom half. But it's, it's not a James Bond film, so you can't judge it on the same level. Yeah, me. it's uh, like I I can rank the Bond films as a collection on their own. I uh, yeah, comparing them to other films. I mean, it's it's sort of like saying, do you like The Exorcist or Back to the Future more? Maybe. <laughs> Back to the future. Easy. It's funny though. Yeah. It's it's weird how Sol can make these very specific delineations between films. That's why you can make a a very exact like top one hundred list and stuff like that. <laughs> Whereas I would think like eh, it's not that easy to just directly compare these films. A group of it's films. It's easy. You just it's like look if if you if you add ten types of berry and a banana on a tasting platter and you had to go like right which one of the which one of these do i like the most you're saying like oh well i could figure out which of the berries i liked but the banana's going to completely throw everything off if anything i'd have an easier time deciding how much i like the banana in comparison to the berries the berries are also similar that well you I... know, it's more nuanced and well, I don't know. I mean, after you've seen, like, hundreds and thousands of films, it gets a bit more difficult. Uh, well, I, again, I don't really... Yeah, but there's only 23 Bond films. Yeah, but it's like yeah, but it's like saying, what do you like best, apple, orange, banana? It's like, well, sometimes I'm in a banana yeah. kind of mood. Well, I'm never in a banana mood. I'd, I'd probably say apple, orange, but I'd probably do that order. If I'm apple, using orange, it banana. as an amusing... You know, a comedy device, banana. <laughs> if I'm eating it, probably an orange. No, they, you just did it. You just did it. So do that for <laughs> James Bond with Kingsman. <laughs> I mean, this is why I, I don't really like rating Bond films out of 10 either, because I'm sure that I've probably given Bond films less of a rating than I have the Kingsman films, but I would almost certainly want to oh, you definitely watch are. any Bond film over any Kingsman really? film. Certainly, even the weakest of the really? Bond films. Really? Even yeah, easily. Yes. You'd rather watch Thunderball uh, than Kingsman. <laughs> yes. Wow. That I mean that is weird though. I mean I you're acting like this is weird of me. I think that speaks to something weird about you that you you <laughs> don't like Thunderball and yet you'd rather watch it than a film you do quite like Kingsman 2. Well, I enjoy well th- this is the thing with Kingsman as I sort of I, I, I can't I have difficulty articulating my uh feelings about it because I do enjoy it I just don't like it and I feel it's okay. kind of like Alan said I feel kind of grubby afterwards I feel like I've been at a pub and some strange local man has come over and sort of yeah. like ranted at me about his sort of political views for 2 hours or something Is this like um is this like obviously how much you enjoy something isn't necessarily tied to how good you think it is? We we just covered Vampire's Kiss on this podcast, and I think Alan and I both agree that it's a film we like more than is justified by the quality of the film because it's just so inexplicable and bizarre, and Nicolas Cage is, uh, you know, peak Cage. So are you kind of getting a degree of that out of you know Thunderball to keep going back to that as a bad Bond film. What was the question? I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there we go. So there is a Kingsman 3 coming out that's a direct continuation. Yes. A King's Man, which is a prequel. Well, well, you say coming out. There is a Kingsman 3 Matthew Vaughan would like to make. I don't yes. think okay. it's been officially greenlit. I believe it was in development at 20th Century Fox before Disney bought it. And then it's sort of like Kingsman before was already a ways well. down the... Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if this level of, you know, a hundred million (laughs) dollar kind of low level blockbuster film takes something of a hit in uh, the coming years. Because they're saying it's going to be the mid level film that, you know, doesn't get any uh, funding for a while. But I think that might extend up to your blockbusters that go shy of two hundred million dollars because they're not quite blockbuster enough. Mm. I don't know. We'll we'll see. But yeah, Kingsman, the King's Man, rather the uh, prequel set in the olden days, is uh, Victorian time. That's the one coming out that we are tying this into. Um, yeah. And then supposedly Kingsman three and Kingsman four and the Statesman and all these other things will follow. But it probably depends on how well the King's Man does. Just quickly, then a King's Man. Who's in it? What's what's it about? Uh, Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes in it, yeah. Oh, Gemma Arter. I think it's supposed to be about how the Kingsman started and he's like fighting Rasputin or something. <laughs> um, it's basically Ray Fiennes is the Colin Firth role and then they've got some other young, attractive, probably posh boy to be uh, the young man. What's his name? Harris Dickinson. I'm looking at the thing. Oh, Daniel Bruhl. I like him. Gemma Arterton. Aaron Taylor-Johnson. Stanley Tucci. Tom Hollander. 
Oh, Tom Hollander as um, George V and his cousins. <laughs> That's quite good, I suppose. It was, they famously looked like each other. So this is going to be like lead up to the First World War then, I guess? I think so. There's presumably going to be a sequence where one of Tom Hollander's characters, Nicholas II or someone, uh, gets dressed up as George V. And then George V is like going to bed to brush his teeth and he looks in the mirror, but it's not a mirror, it's a doorway. <laughs> and the other one stood there and he has to like mime along pretending to be his reflection. <laughs> I, I'm not even. I'm genuinely. I'm putting money on there being some variation of that in this film. <laughs> Quite possibly. Who, who's making it? Oh, Matthew Vaughn. Okay. Yeah. Anything could happen. Yes. Yes. Reese Fan as Rasputin. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Are they actually going to put this out any time, or is it going to come out in 2021? Yeah. Well, it's still scheduled for September, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's set for a uh, 16th of September UK release. That doesn't feel like that's going to happen. But I I really... I mean, I know the cinema is currently open uh, and has been mm. for a couple of weeks playing classic Warner Brothers movies. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Tenet's delayed now, isn't it? Again, so... I think they're coming up with some kind of different strategy of releasing so they can do it in cinemas in places, but also in... And Mulan's just going straight to premium. Lowered expectations. I'm ready to quit films. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to never watch a new film again. I'll just watch stuff that was made before 2020. Um, I'm alright with that. I've got plenty of stuff to catch up with. I think you're pretty much gonna get that wish, because I don't think the film industry's <laughs> gonna make many new films for a while. I think there's gonna be a bit of a bottleneck of uh, stuff. Like, the next you know, year might be quite busy, and then after that, uh, yeah, cinemas will be turned into flats. Ooh! Yeah, I'd love to live in an old... Uh... An old screen 10 at Cineworld. Mm. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah. High ceilings. Yeah. Well, uh, well audio proofed rooms as well, you know, no no annoying <laughs> noise from your neighbour. <laughs> That'd be great. Wouldn't it be great? Baskin they, Robbins on like, your doorstep. Wouldn't it be great if they were like, we turn, we've got a 15 screen cinema, we're going to turn it into flats. That's 15 flats. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just a big empty room. They take the chairs out put a double bed in it and a kitchen at one corner they they leave <laughs> they'll have to leave some chairs in like a, next to a, a little table with a couple of chairs cinema chairs if they leave the 4d chairs in that's <laughs> the flat i want <laughs> it's a shame that everything's slanted so you can't like rest anything <laughs> down because <laughs> it just goes rolling towards one end of the room but that'd be great if you could use the projector watch a big you know play your games on there and on the 4d <laughs> i'll be up with that I don't think they'd leave it in. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not it's not actually happening to be fair. So it's... <laughs> Okay, until next time. Thanks guys. Yeah. Come back next week. See ya. Thank you, William Fletcher, especially. Yes, thank you. <laughs> this diminishing returns time capsule episode. As I said at the start, we recorded this on the eleventh of April two thousand and twenty. Which means that William Fletcher's letter is now actually somewhat outdated, through no fault of his, I should add. Subsequent 10 out of 10 ratings that have been on the show are Night of the Living Dead, which I gave a 10 out of 10. That was, of course, the 1968 original and not one of the awful remakes. 1978's Dawn of the Dead, which I also gave a 10 out of 10 to. And Citizen Kane, which both myself and Calvin gave a 10 out of 10. I'm actually recording this outro in November of 2020, so it's very possible there will be even more 10 out of 10s that have come and gone. But once again, I, I can't be bothered recording another of these, I'm sorry. See you next week.